we welcome you once again into the presence of God. It's a little bit different this weekend, but I'll tell you one thing I know for sure. There is a word from God in the house. Pastor Robert Madu is about to come preach the word. And let me tell you something. When we were talking on the phone, when all of this craziness started to unfold around this weekend of March 14th and 15th, and we didn't know from moment to moment what the restrictions would be, number one, my friend, this this amazing gift of a human being showed no hesitation about coming to minister. We had planned it, of course, months ago, uh, but one thing that he asked me was, are you sure you don't want to cancel me and uh, ev everything is being canceled right now? Do you just need to preach? And I said, trust me, I'm going to speak to our people. I'm going to speak to all of the people who are part of our church family, but God put it in you what we need this weekend. God knew. Hey. There is no finer communicator of the gospel of Jesus Christ that I know than Pastor Robert Madu. So I know that God's word is in him today. Let's act like there's a hundred thousand people in this room right where you are. Receive my friend, Pastor Robert Madu. Oh, anybody love Jesus in this place today? Come on, wherever you are, can you give Jesus the biggest hand clap of praise that you got? Oh, come on, you can do better than that. You got a reason to give him some praise today. Woo! I tell you what, greetings to you, whether you've been a part of the EFAM for a long time or whether you're part of EFAM by demand today. I, uh, I want you to know this, whether you're watching this in a coffee shop with some friends or in a living room or in the kitchen or whether it's just you in your bathrobe with your cats, you got to know what today is. You got to know what today is. Hear me. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Come on, we got to rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, wherever you are, would you give King Jesus just the best praise that you got? God, we still bless you. We still magnify you. You're still worthy of the praise. Hallelujah. You may be seated, all the spiritual staff that are here. And uh, I tell you what, I am incredibly honored and privileged to be back here at Elevation. Uh, I think this is like my fourth time here, so I'm for sure a part of the family uh, by now. And uh, I want you to know, especially in times like these, it's just, just proof positive that the Church of Jesus Christ gets to shine brighter just lets us know that the church is not a building you come to. It's not some organization that you join. The church is really a family where you belong. And uh, I'm just thankful, not just for the church at large, but I'm thankful for Elevation Church that's already had a plan in place and just doing what they've been doing to make sure, come on, that the gospel of Jesus Christ keeps going out. Wherever you are, you ought to thank God for this church. You ought to type amen, put a fire emoticon if you're thankful. Come on for Elevation Church. and. It's incredible. And this church is making an impact literally around the world, but I'm, I'm thankful for Pastor Stephen Holly Ferdy for saying yes to the call of God. And I got to say this, Pastor Stephen is one of the most important and powerful voices of this generation, not just by sermon, but by song. Uh, but what I'm so thankful for is that he's a friend. He's an incredible friend, and I thank God for you and for your wife and your family. Come on, can we celebrate the great man of God? Come on, y'all could do better than that. We're blessed. So I'm glad to be here. I bring you greetings from the great country of Texas. And uh, we're going to have church in here today. If somebody asks me, what you, what you going to preach? I said, I'm going to preach, but I'm really, just, I'm really just giving a news report. That's what I'm doing. I'm giving a news report because the gospel is good news. And I find it interesting that whenever somebody's reporting the news, they call that person the anchor. It's interesting that whatever story you let sink into your soul, it will navigate your life. And today, I want the gospel of Jesus Christ to sink into your soul today. So I'm going to preach it like I feel it. You ready? Come on, let's jump straight into this word today. Go with me to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. I want to look at verses 1 through 10. And wherever you are watching this, make sure you're getting responsive. Shout like the NBA season was still going on. Just don't touch anybody, but give God some praise. Acts chapter 3. We're going to start at verse number 1. 
and we'll land at verse number 10. When you're ready to read it, say, yeah. yeah. If you need some time, say, hold up. All right. It says, one day. Hmm. It's already good. One day. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get a little something, something from them. And Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. First thing Pete said to him is, bro, I ain't got it. That's actually where a lot of people get stuck in life. A lot of people get stuck because you're fully aware of what you do not have. In fact, I found that the enemy is proficient at reminding you of what you do not have. He'll tell you, oh, you come on, I'm the only one you ever been scrolling through the gram, heard the enemy loud in your ear saying, you ain't got that, you ain't got that, you better be scared, you don't got this, you don't got that. He loves to remind you of what you do not have, but thank God for that comma, there's power in the punctuation. Peter didn't stop at what he did not have. He goes, but what I do have, oh, he says, I got something. What I do have, I give you, and I'm not giving it in my name. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him. They said, hold up. As the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Can you say amen? amen. I'm intrigued about this man who is stuck at a gate called Beautiful. Certainly at this time in our nation, many of us feel stuck right now. But look at where he's stuck. He's stuck at a gate called beautiful. I want to talk to you today just using this as a title, The Beauty of Being Stuck. The Beauty of Being Stuck. Would you just look at somebody around you and say, there's a beauty. Again, don't touch them, but you better look at them and say it loud. Come on, say, there's a beauty to being stuck. Come on, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that even in tumultuous times, you are our peace. Lord, we can hang on to you. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts today. God, we've not come to be entertained. We have come to hear from you. So speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Everybody say it. Oh, come on. Everybody say it. The beauty of being stuck. Has anybody been to an airport lately? I have. I have. I have. Uh, I flew in yesterday, and for the first time, after 15 years of traveling, almost 3 million miles flown, I got to the airport, and the airport was peaceful. Oh, it was peaceful. I'm telling you, there was no crazy lines. There were just a few people on the flight. People, I flew from Dallas to Charlotte for $3.55. It, it was awesome. It was peaceful. And, you're laughing because you know that generally the airport is chaotic. Generally, it is absolutely crazy. It is stressful to travel. In fact, I've often said that if you really want to test your faith, book you a flight, okay? Just book you a flight, all right? If you really think you're full of the Spirit, fly Spirit and then come holler at your boy because it is stressful in these traveling streets. In fact, the Bible says, the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. Don't forget that last one, self-control. If you are a believer, then that fruit should be evident in your life. However, if you're watching online or you're here in the room, you're like, man, Robert, I got all that fruit, but you've never flown before? 
How do I say this? I don't believe you, okay? I do not believe you because the airport is designed to suck the fruit of the Spirit out of you. The whole airport system is orchestrated to make you lose your sanity and your Christianity. So uh, as, as a consequence over the years, I've developed what I call Robert's Rules of Flying, okay? I won't bore you with all of them, but I'll just give you one. I do nonstop flights only, okay? I'm not about that connection life. Just take me from Dallas to my destination, okay? I'm a nonstop ninja. Uh, only problem with my rule is the reality that there are just some places in life, if you're going to go, you will have to stop and make a connection. Oh, that'll preach. I might say that again later. <laughs> so the challenge for me is when my departing flight is late and I got to connect in another city. And when I get in that connecting city, I got 1.5 minutes to get to my next gate. And to add to that, I landed at gate A1, but my connecting gate is at gate Z99. And I got 1.5 minutes to get to gate Z99. Church, at this point, I only got three options, okay? I can miss my flight, ain't gonna happen. I can call for that cute little cart to carry me there, ain't gonna happen, I'm a grown man. <laughs> Or I can just run with everything I got, like Usain Bolt or Forrest Gump. Just run to make this flight. This happens all the time. One day I was running with everything I got, just trying to get to gate Z99. But one day I was running and I just saw something in the distance. I saw something that reminded me of the goodness of God. I saw something that lets me know that God is still in the miracle working business. I saw something that lets me know that God can do exceedingly, abundantly above all that you may ask or think. I saw one of those, ooh, wait for it, moving walkways. Have you ever seen those before? Those moving walkways. See, I'm about to have church on the moving walkway. Because to me, the moving walkway is just like having the favor of God on your life. Because how many know if you just start walking on that moving walkway, it is going to expedite your journey. It can get you there quicker than you could have in your own strength, and your own talent, and your own ability. I love a moving walkway. Hold up. Only problem though with the moving walkway, my only issue with the moving walkway, my only frustration with the moving walkway are the people on the moving walkway who refuse to move. Oh, what is wrong with y'all? This is what I came to talk about today. What is wrong with y'all people? Why in the world would you be standing with your big old suitcase that should have been checked? Why are you standing on the move? Just frustrating people standing on the move and walkway. I think my frustration with you people who are watching online right now, it's not that you're standing you were standing at any other place in the airport, I would be cool with it. I think my frustration stems from the fact that you have brought stagnation on a mechanism that was created for movement. Yeah, that's, that, that's my frustration is that you have brought stagnation and stuckness to something that was actually designed to move you further and faster. And anytime you have stagnation in a place that was created for movement, you will always have frustration or always have frustration. Come on, this is traffic. I don't mind sitting down for an hour, looking out of a window, listening to some music. Come on, if I'm in my house, that's catching the vibe. I don't want to do it in my car. Come on, that's why some of you right now are losing your mind in your house because you are not created to be stuck. And anytime you have stagnation in the place created for movement, you always have frustration. And I'm wondering today if the reason why so many of us are frustrated with our lives and where we are is because our lives have become stuck, still, and stationary when God created us for movement. Could it be possible, even plausible today, that the reason you're annoyed with where you are is not because you're stuck indoors. It is because your life has become stuck and God created you for movement because you do know that God is a God of movement. Oh, come on. He has always taken you somewhere. He has always taken you from faith to faith. He's always taken you from strength to strength. He's taken you from glory to glory. God is a God of movement. Come on, that's why the Bible says that the steps of the righteous, the steps are ordered by the Lord. Not the stuckness, the steps are ordered by the Lord. Why are the steps ordered? Because God is a God of movement. 
One of the first things God shows us in the Bible is that he is a God of movement. Some of you are like, give us the scripture for it, Robert. I'll give you the scripture. This is chapter one. Chapter one, it says, in the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, and the spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. The first thing that God revealed about himself is that I am a God that moves on your behalf. In fact, to me, Genesis, Genesis was just the commencement of a symphony, the beginning of a symphony, where God, the cosmic conductor, just pulls out his big old omnipotent baton and just began a melody of movement. Because everything he made, it had to move. Everything that he created, it had a cadence, it had a pace to it. Not a single thing he made got the luxury of stagnation. Everything he he created. He said, let there be light. Put the whole solar system in place. And once everything was set, he went, oh yeah, y'all can't be still. Get to moving. And all of a sudden, and everything just started moving. Everything started, even right now, we are moving. Right now, we are, you can't even feel it, but we are moving right now. See, that's why you gotta stop judging what God is doing in your life based off of how you feel. Sometimes it has nothing to do with your feelings, nothing to do with what you see. Even when you can't see it, he is moving. Even right now in this nation, he is moving. God is a God of movement. Everything he made, it had to move. He he said, let there be water and told the water to get to move it. said, water, you can't be still. No, that's mosquitoes. Get to move it. And the water started moving. Every animal he made, it had to move. Looked at a cheetah and told the cheetah to get to move it. Can you see that cheetah? Everything he made, it had to move. Looked at a turtle and had the nerve, the audacity to tell a turtle to get to moving. The turtle was like, God, I'm an introvert. I don't want to come out of my shell. He's like, no, you still got to move. You ain't got to be as fast as the cheetah, but you still got to move. And here comes the turtle. Everything God made, it had to move. He reaches down in dirt, creates man, breathes into him the breath of lies. And guess what your heart started doing? It started moving. Come on, that's why when you go to the doctor for your checkup, he puts in his headphones and he listens. You know what he's listening for? He's listening for that same beat that began in the beginning. And if there's irregularities in that beat, that means there's something wrong in your body. See, this is why I give God the best praise, no matter what's coming against me. Not because my life is perfect. I'm praising him because I'm still here. I'm still alive. I'm not dead. I still got a purpose. And that alone is enough for me to give God some praise. Oh, I'm telling you, your praise ain't quarantined. I need you to just take 10 seconds and give God some praise like you're thankful that you're still here, that you're still standing, that there is breath in your body, that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. I feel like preaching now. God is a God of movement. Oh, you don't believe God's a God of movement? You don't believe he's a God of movement? People, two-thirds of his name is go. <laughs> he defeated death, hell, and the grave. He's about to ascend back to the right hand of the Father. But before he leaves, the disciples are looking at him like, hold on, can we get like a commission or something? Like a great commission? He's like, oh, you want a commission? All right, go! <laughs> into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature, making disciples of all nations. God is a God of movement. Challenge, the problem that occurs is that God is a God of movement, but humanity, you and I, we have this tendency, we got this propensity to always get stuck. Have you noticed this about us? Oh, we love to get stuck. I'm not even talking about what's going on in the world right now. I'm just talking about just natural stuff. Like, like you go to the same four restaurants, some of y'all, all the time. Some of y'all don't know what to do on this weekend because when you go to church, you sit in the same section, in the same seat every weekend. I know people have been to church for years. Don't even check out the left or the right side of the sanctuary. You just sit in the same spot all the time. Get stuck. We get stuck in relationships. Some of y'all dating the same people, same girl. Got a different name, but it's the same girl. It's the same person. Just get stuck. We get stuck. It is intrinsic within our DNA. In fact, I, I'd even argue theologically that all that is wrong with the world today is because humanity got stuck. 
Adam and Eve, they got stuck. They didn't keep it moving. They got stuck at the wrong tree, listening to the wrong voice, so they made the wrong choice. And now we are reaping the ramifications of their decisions that they made when they were stuck. And intrinsic within our DNA is this sickness of stuckness. My text today is in Acts chapter 3. And no doubt there's a man who is stuck. But I mentioned Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve because I think there's actually a connection. There's a synergy between Genesis chapter 3 and Acts chapter 3. Because if you look at Acts chapter 3 just at a micro level, which we will look at today, you're going to see a man who is stuck, who is lame, excuse me, lame from birth, outside the temple gate begging, no access to the presence of God. And one day, Peter and John, full of the Holy Spirit, raise him up. But if we broaden the scope of this text and look at it really at a macro level, keeping Genesis 3 in mind, I submit to you that this man is really just a picture of the spiritual condition of humanity. Because every single one of us spiritually were lame from birth. Oh, you know you were born lame, right? <laughs> born lame. You came out the womb, spiritually speaking, completely lame. Some of you are like, uh-uh, Robert, I'm a good person. No, lame. <laughs> you were born spiritually lame. And I'll prove it to you. Have you noticed nobody had to teach you how to lie? Wow. Now, what class did you take on selfishness? Oh, not one. At two, you perfected the art of mine. <laughs> That's why some of y'all freaking out right now, just getting all the toilet paper. Just all the toilet paper. You don't want to save nothing for nobody. Just it is in our DNA just to get stuck to be selfish, narcissistic, individualistic people. This is what sin did to us. We had no access to the presence of God. So really, Peter and John raising this man up is a picture of what the cross did. It is the cross of Jesus Christ that raised me up. I don't have to be a beggar now. I actually have access to the presence of God. I can approach the throne of grace with confidence, not because of what I did, but because of what he did on the cross. It is the blood of Jesus that gives me access. So there is a synergy between Acts chapter 3 and Genesis chapter 3. Because in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve took of that forbidden fruit and all of humanity got stuck, in that moment we were all stuck. And it's not the way it works in the Bible. This is how my exegetical imagination works. In fact, let me just pause wherever you are. Just let me get a little water break real quick. You can give God some praise while I get a little water break real quick. Come on, you can do better than that. Give them some praise. There's no smooth way to do that. You just got to give God praise. When Adam and Eve got stuck, I think in that, me, me, in that moment, all of a sudden, it's not how it is in the Bible. It's the way my mind works. All of a sudden, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit immediately called an executive Trinity team meeting in heaven. God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all three there, one, all at the same time. And they look down and God the Father goes, y'all see what I see? They stuck. You know, they can't get themselves out. So uh, one of y'all going to have to go down there and get them out. And immediately, Jesus looks at the Holy Spirit and says, well, can't nobody move like you. So why don't you go down there and get them out? And the Holy Spirit is like, nah, 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 Jesus, don't play, don't play. Come on, come on. You know, I'm Acts chapter 2, you Matthew chapter 1. Don't try to jack up the Bible, Jesus. Nah, nah, nah. you the Savior of the world. You go down there and get them out. And Jesus is like, you're right, you're right, I'm tripping. And Jesus, check this out, gets on the balcony of heaven jumps off the balcony of heaven. It was a 42 generation jump, but he lands in the womb of a virgin named Mary. I'm at Christmas. And all of a sudden Mary goes, oh, I'm not feeling good. So she calls her pray. He calls her fiance, uh, Joseph, and says, I need to talk to you. And Joseph's like, yeah, we need to talk. Why you been so distant lately? What, you don't want to get married anymore? And Mary's like, no, Joseph, don't do that. You know I love you. Uh-uh, don't play. Here, come here. He's like, what? He's like, here, come here. She takes Joseph's hand, puts it on her stomach. Joseph and goes, whoa! Something just moved. She goes, yeah, that's what he does. All of a sudden, there is tension in their relationship. So Mary calls her pregnant cousin Elizabeth and says, girl, I got to see you. And Mary takes an Uber to her pregnant cousin Elizabeth's house. But when she gets to the Uber, she steps out and meets her pregnant cousin Elizabeth. And they both waddle up on each other like two penguins in Alaska meeting for the very first time. And Elizabeth goes, girl, you ain't going to believe this. I have not felt my baby move in weeks. But as soon as you got out of that Uber, girl, my baby started kicking and moving around. I don't know what's on the inside of you, but it's making my baby move on the inside of me. And Mary goes, yeah, that's what he does. All of a sudden, Elizabeth goes, I cannot believe you took an Uber. 
Uber down here. Girl, you are pregnant. And Mary goes, yeah. And the Uber driver was weird too. <laughs> Elizabeth goes, really? What was his name? Mary goes, John. Elizabeth goes, hmm, I like that name. Fast forward 30 years later, John the Baptist is baptizing people in the Jordan River. And please believe that the water is still moving from the same cadence of creation. And John almost drowns a dude in the middle of the baptism because he looks in the distance and says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. This is the one I was telling y'all about. I'm baptizing you with water, but he's going to baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. Somebody ought to give him some praise wherever you are. I feel like preaching it. All of a sudden... All of a sudden, John and Jesus meet in the water and it goes in slow motion. And one of John's disciples low-key goes, yo, you know this dude? And John was like, yes, I know this dude. He is the dude. And what's crazy is the first time we met, we were in water. Now we're meeting again in water. This must be a destiny moment. You know the story. He baptizes Jesus. The heavens open up. Jesus starts moving in the earth, healing the sick, raising the dead. He gets to the cross and defeats him, gets up from the grave and defeats death, and then he ascends back to heaven, and the Trinity executive team meeting is readjourned. And the Holy Spirit and God the Father look at Jesus and go, man, you killed that thing. And Jesus goes, you know, I did the best that I could. And then they look at the Holy Spirit and say, it's on you now. The Holy Spirit goes, I know, I know, I know. And the Holy Spirit gets on the balcony of heaven, jumps off the balcony of heaven, but lands in the upper room, Acts chapter 2. And suddenly, a sound as a mighty rushing wind begin to fill some people who were stuck in a room, but said, I'm still going to wait for the promise, even though I'm stuck and can't go out. His presence can come in. And all of a sudden, all of them, God filled with the Holy Spirit, being to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And in that room was Peter and John. Now I'm at my text. By the way, I just gave you the whole Bible like in 10 minutes. No, it's cool. Just sit there. Sorry, I just sit there. And in that room was Peter and John. Peter and John go, well, we just got power to be as witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we're going to start in Jerusalem. So Peter and John said, hey, what do we do? Well, let's go pray. Let's go pray. Let's go to the church and pray. Can you see Peter and John walking together to Elevation Church to pray? Peter and John together going to church. Peter and John, quick question. What are these two dudes still doing hanging out? You realize they don't have to hang out anymore. Jesus has already ascended to heaven. The only thing that connected them was that Jesus handpicked them. He selected them. They don't got to hang out anymore. Why in the world are Peter and John going to church together? You realize they're a walking contradiction. Peter and John? Come on, one of these things is not like the other. First of all, Peter is much older. John is younger. Okay, let me bring it to you. John is walking on TikTok. <laughs> Peter's still on Facebook. Peter <laughs> and John together. But Peter and John, they are walking contradiction. People, John is a lover. Peter is a cusser. They are completely different. When John got ready to express his love and his loyalty to Jesus, he would put his head on the chest of Jesus. He loved to cuddle with Jesus. When Peter got ready to express his loyalty for Jesus, homeboy put out a sword, a switchblade, cut a dude's ear all the way off. Jesus had to heal it real quick. Like, Peter, what are you doing? Peter's like, I'm with you, Jesus. I'm ride or die. I don't know about him, but I'm with you. Peter! And John, John's an introvert. He's always to himself. Peter gonna say something crazy. I'm just trying to figure out how a gangster and Gandhi are going to church together. Talking about this gonna be a good service. Peter and John, they're a walking contradiction. Oh, maybe that's the point. Maybe that's the point. You understand the healing of this lame man is the first miracle after the birth of the New Testament church. I submit to you, this isn't an ordinary miracle. This is a prototype miracle by which God is trying to show the church today how his power moves in the earth. 
Perhaps the reason that Peter and John are walking together as a walking contradiction is because God is still trying to get the church today to understand that what the culture calls a contradiction, the kingdom calls collaboration. Oh, what the culture sees as the greatest place of division and separation. How many know in the kingdom of God, it is the greatest place of collaboration. It is the place where lame people can get up again. And I want to challenge some of y'all, especially in this day and age in which we live, where everybody's trying to keep us divided. I know we're divided now because we can't touch each other. I'm talking about divided in the church, focusing on the contradiction. And I'm telling you, the power is in our ability to collaborate and in spite of the contradiction come on somebody this is the power of the church the power of the church is not that we have all everything in common the power is in our differences but in spite of our differences if we can agree that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father if we can agree that broken people need to be restored and lay people need to get up if we could just collaborate oh I wonder what God would do it's a trick of the enemy to get us to focus on the contradictions. Ah, you black. Oh, I'm white. Oh, you're a Democrat. Oh, I'm a Republican. Focusing on the contradictions. I'm telling you, our power is in our ability to collaborate in spite of the contradictions. Isn't it crazy that the first miracle after the birth of the New Testament church was a collaboration between one disciple that had a big heart, John, and another disciple that had a big mouth, Peter. <laughs> and perhaps it was perhaps it was John's compassion that noticed the lame man. But it took Peter's courage. Wow, wow. Yo, hey bro, get up. <laughs> And nobody gonna feel sorry for you. Get, uh, I still got a knife in my pocket. Get. Uh, and John's like, Peter, love. <laughs> Collaboration. Can't just talk about Peter and John. Come on, they're not the star of the text today. I think the star of the text is a man that many of us right now in our world can relate to. It's this man who is, uh, who is stuck. I didn't tell the cameraman I was going to do this, but y'all got all kinds of cameras everywhere here, so I know we good. <laughs> but often when I preach a text like this, I will do this because I want to feel, even if it's just for a moment, who I'm preaching about, what they had to go through. Can you think about even in our current context today, we don't understand what many of our disabled, and disabled brothers and sisters have to face. Can you imagine in biblical antiquity no wheelchairs, no hover rounds. It was the epitome of being stuck. Somebody dropped you off, you better get comfortable. You're going to be there for a while. And I thought about this. The only thing that didn't work in this man's life were his legs. Everything else worked. Heart beating, eyes seeing, cognitive capabilities there. Homeboy probably had good teeth. <laughs> All that was shut down because one thing didn't work. It affected his economy. He's got a bag. It affected his relationships. Tell me that when you're stuck, you can only talk to other stuck people because lame recognizes lame. <laughs> Just stuck. And because one thing didn't work. Isn't it crazy how one issue in your life can affect everything? Look at our world. One thing has affected everything. One thing has shut down his whole life and you get stuck. And when you've been stuck for a while, you start developing what I call systems of stuckness. Start doing what you got to do to get around. Start getting comfortable because this is the way that life is going to be. Start having stuck conversations with other stuck people. You've had stuck conversations. Hey, bro, what you going to do today? Man, probably lay here for a little bit. I was thinking the same thing. I'm probably going to lay here. So you've had stuck conversations with other stuck people. Just the same thing they talk about now going to be the same thing. If you were just stuck, stuck. There's nothing worse than being stuck. But how many of you know some of you experienced this? Have you ever been stuck but experienced God raising you up? Oh, this is a beautiful thing. Is that When you've been stuck, maybe it's happening for some of you right now. You heard a word. You heard a worship song when you were panicking can, but you realize that the favor of the Lord was upon you. You ever been stuck and had God raise you up? It's a beautiful thing to be raised up when you've been stuck. Well, the problem is you spend so much time being stuck, you still got relationships with the stuck people. 
And don't you try to go back and have those same stuck conversations, but the jokes ain't funny anymore. You try to figure out what in the world did I ever have in common with you? You, you still doing that? You 50 years old. You still trying to turn up in the club? You ever just still the same thing? And then they got the nerve to look at you and say, mm, seem like you changing. Yeah, it seemed like something different about you. It seemed like you changed it as if it's a bad thing. How many know that is the point of life? You are supposed to be changing. Come on, I don't want to be who I always was. I want to be everything that God has created and ordained me to be. You better believe I'm changing. Every day I'm changing. Oh, it seemed like you changed it. it. seemed like you stuck up. No, I'm not stuck up. I'm just up. You stuck. That's why the conversation <laughs> ain't working anymore. <laughs> God raises you up when you've been stuck. But that's not really what I want to talk about. All that was my intro. I, um, I think the thing that I missed about this text is the Bible says every day they dropped him off in front of the temple. Come on, not, not just on a weekend experience. Not just once a week. Every day they dropped this man in front of the temple gate. So if he got dropped every day, that means there are two people in this passage that nobody ever talks about. Yeah. I've never talked about them. Everybody talks about Peter and John, but if he got dropped at the temple gate every day, that means there are two other people in this passage that nobody ever talks about. And guess what? Ooh, I invited them to Elevation Church today. I'm going to ask them to come out real quick because everybody is focused on the lame man and Peter and John. But I want to know, yeah... Everybody talks about the lame man. Everybody talks about Peter and John. But how come nobody talks about y'all? Because he got dropped every day. Come on, I study. I, I did my due diligence. I did an etymological exploratory on this word every day. Guess what every day means? Er a day. Every day. He dropped him. Every day. Do you know what every day means? Now, it's going to be interesting because we're going to keep our distance here. But that means Sunday, you came, you picked him up. Don't touch him. <laughs> Come on, just want to abide to the rules. You, you picked him up. You picked him up. You carried him from wherever he lived to the church. You would hold out your cup and beg. Just hold out your cup. Hold out your cup and beg. Maybe y'all would come back about 5 o'clock, pick him right back up, drop him back off, and then go about your day. That's Sunday. Monday, here come these two again. Let's give them a name, Billy and Bob. Nobody talks about Billy and Bob. Everybody talks about Peter and John. That means Monday, you come. You pick them up. You carry them all the way over here to the church. You hold out the cup and beg. You come back about 5 o'clock, drop them back at the house, then you go home. That's Tuesday, Wednesday morning. Ding dong, here come Billy and Bob again. They pick them up. Just pretend like you're going to. Don't touch them. Keep the distance. Pretend like you're going to pick them up. Pretend like, don't touch them. Yeah. And you pick them up again. And then you come back over here. And you drop them off at the church. Holds out his cup and bags. They come back about 5 o'clock. And then drop them off. That's what every single day. Can you imagine the laborious nature of picking him up every day? Holding out his cup. Begging. Pick him back up. Drop him off. And I hope I'm not bringing my own presupposition to this biblical passage, but I think one of those days, after every day, maybe Billy and Bob did it out of the kindness of their heart for like a week. Scratch that. They go to elevation. They did it for like a month. <laughs> every day. I think one of those days, Billy and Bob dropped him off. He held out his cup. He came back about five o'clock. Look in that cup. Yeah. You see what I see. <laughs> There's money in that cup. You see what they just did? They got their cut. Actually, you took too much. Put some back. Put some back. Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, put some back. Now that you have your cut, then you pick them back up. Not for real. Then you take them home. Hmm. And now they have become collaborators to a sick system. Somebody who's stuck. How many know at this point, Billy and Bob don't want him healed? They don't want him whole. It would affect their pockets. 
they have become, maybe unbeknowing, the beneficiaries of his brokenness and his stuckness. That's why whenever you are stuck, you got to check your environment. You got to check who's around you and make sure you got to check what you're hearing and make sure nobody is benefiting from your stuckness. And Billy and Bob could be anybody. Billy and Bob could be the news that you're watching. Billy and Bob could be a friend. Billy and Bob could be somebody you're dating. Some of you is awkward because you sitting next to your Billy and Bob right now. (laughs) But in your life, whenever you're stuck, there will always be Peters and Johns who are trying to pull you up out of your stuckness. They're trying to call you into your purpose and your destiny. But there will also be Billys and Bobs who want you to stay stuck and not step into what God has for you. Thank you so much. Y'all were brilliant, especially for not touching anybody. Y'all play something real soft to make me sound spiritual. (laughs) Later, we'll find out that system of getting picked up and dropped off. Don't miss this. That went on for 40 years. 40 years. Can you imagine 40 years? Every day, get picked up. Hold out my cup. Make a few bucks. Give them their cut go back home. 40 years? Get picked up. Hold out my cup. Make a few bucks. Give them their cut. Go back home. 40 years. After 40 years, you're just a robot. Just going through the motions. Some of you, I just described your life. You call it your job. (laughs) Go to work. Get picked up. Make a few bucks. Give the IRS their cut. Go back home. Is is that why God created you? No, he came that you might have a life. And life more abundantly. No matter where you are, no matter what's going on, even in our world right now, you were not created to be stuck. God created you for movement. He's taken you somewhere. I love it because even after 40 years of that system, even after 40 years, the Bible says one day, after 40 years of going through the motions, after 40 years of never looking up, after 40 years of no hope, after 40 years of the monotonous routine of just going through life but not living life, after 40 years, the Bible says one day, after 40 years, one day, come on, don't tell me that you've been stuck in whatever you're stuck in too long. You can have the hope of one day. Somebody watch me right now. This is your one day that even after being stuck, some of you physically, some of you spiritually, some of you for so many years, you can have a one day, one day after 40 years. He hears voices full of the Holy Spirit who say, look at us. The Bible says that he gave Peter and John his attention, expecting to get something. He gave them his attention because if God can get your attention, then he can shift the direction of your life. If he can get your attention, he'll exceed your expectation, but he's got to get your attention. I believe even right now, everything some of us are going through, your God is just God trying to get your attention. He's trying to say, come to me. You got to get out of being stuck. Gave him his attention, expecting to get something. Peter and John said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, that's what I give you. Isn't it crazy that his greatest miracle was on the other side of his greatest disappointment? Can you see him? He finally has Peter and John looking at him. He's like, ooh, I'm about to get paid today. They're like, hey, we ain't got it. He's like, what? What you looking at me for then? (laughs) Isn't it crazy? that his greatest miracle was on the other side of his greatest disappointment. Because sometimes God will tell your dream no if you got the wrong dream. Because sometimes when you're stuck, you will downgrade the dream to fit your reality. But God never called you to downgrade your dream to fit your reality. Not when he wants to exceed your expectation. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Oh, I need somebody that knows there's power in that name. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I love Peter. 
because he's just name dropping. Come on, you know people that don't know about that kingdom clout. But sometimes if you're going to drop a name, you better drop a name that can get somebody back up again. Drop the name that is above every single name. Drop the name that can heal the sick. Drop the name that can raise the dead. Drop the name that can open up blind eyes. Drop a name that can turn graves into gardens. Drop the name of Jesus. Somebody give him some praise. Hallelujah. Thank you for watching the Elevation Church YouTube channel. But don't stop here. Join the EFAM, our online extended family, and join us live every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream, and share this with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. God bless you.